Good morning, all you Suhai AP Biology students. This is Mr. McLeod again. Welcome to our next podcast on phylogenetics and the tree of life. In this podcast, we're going to take a look at classification of living organisms in the classic way, called Linnaean classification, after Carlos Linnaeus, and then contrast it with the most recent way to classify organisms called phylogenetics. Now this is a brand new principle in biology, so it may take some time to understand. So put your patient hat on, okay? So get your notes out, some to write with, and let's phylogenize. Okay, so there are three major things we need to know from this podcast. Let's get those in your notes. Number one, the taxonomic categories and how they indicate relatedness or how they're related to each other. Number two, how systematics is used to develop phylogenetic trees. And three, the three domains of life, including their similarities and their differences. So make sure you get those in your notes before we start. Let's get down some basic terminology we'll be using in this podcast. Systematics is the process of classifying organisms and determining their evolutionary relationships. Get that in your notes. Now we accomplish this in two ways. Exploring the taxonomy of living things by classifying them then exploring how they have evolved over time, also called their evolutionary history. This is called phylogenetics. Get that in your notes. So we're going to look at taxonomy or classifying organisms, and then we're going to see how that relates to their history called phylogenetics. Okay, there are three tools biologists use to determine evolutionary relationships. Let's also get these in your notes. The first is the use of fossils, or the remains of living organisms, or their imprinting on rocks. The second is to look at the morphology of organisms. What this means is to look at homologous structures, meaning what structures the organisms have in common. Get that down. While the third is to examine the molecular evidence or the DNA slash amino acid structure of these organisms, make sure you get those in your notes. The classic way to classify organisms was developed by a guy named Carlos Linnaeus and is most likely very familiar to you from your biology class and from our summer assignment as well. If you feel you need to get this in your notes, please do it now. Linnaeus used a two-name naming system called binomial nomenclature that you see right here. For example, in this slide, the panther has the scientific name Panthera pardus. Panthera is the genus name, and pardus is the species name. Again, that should be a review for you, but if it's not, it might be a good idea to get that in your notes. Now, as you can see here, the panther is in the domain eukarya because it's composed of eukaryotic cells. And remember that eukaryotic cells are cells with a true nucleus. You can see that the panther is in the kingdom Animalia, for obvious reasons. It's an animal. It's not a plant or a bacteria. It's in the phylum chordata because it has a backbone or a cord that runs through the backbone called the spinal cord. It's in the class Mammalia because it's a mammal. It's in the order Carnivora because it eats meat. And it's in the family Felidae because it's a feline or cat. 
However, what separates it from all other cats is its genus and species name combined, and that was developed by Linnaeus. Make sure you understand that. Now, in modern classification, biologists have added the three domains to Linnaeus' work. The domain bacteria, archaea, which are both bacteria types, and eukaryota, which are the true nucleus organisms. So make sure you get those in your notes. So we now must add a domain to the top of the classification line, which changes the way we memorize their order. Now any one of these ways to remember the proper order will do. So you see here, dear King Philip came over for good spaghetti. Used to be King Philip came over for good spaghetti, but now we have to add the deer. Or you could say, dear King Philip crossed over great five great seas, or dear King Philip came over from Germany stoned, or dear King Fit Philip came over from Granny Smith, or whatever you want to do, or you can make up your own. However, you need to know their proper order. You most likely learn this system without the domain category. Make sure you add it to your memory tool. Biologists now organize these classes into what's called a phylogenetic tree. You see an example of one here in this slide. A phylogenetic tree is a branching diagram that shows the evolutionary history of a group of organisms and includes the classification categories we just mentioned on this slide. Write that down. Now what this tree tries to indicate is the evolutionary history of these animals and any common ancestors they are hypothesized to have had. Also write that down. The key word there is hypothesized. Remember a hypothesis is um, an educated prediction. For example, in this tree, the European otter, the European otter that you see right here, and the American badger, which you see above it, appear to be in the same family. And it looks like they have a, had a common ancestor as well. Now, where you would find the common ancestor, whoops, would be at this branching of the tree right here. So this would be the common answer. So we're going to learn a bunch about the mechanics here in a little bit. However, they are both different species evident by their name. While the coyote and the gray wolf are both in the genus Canis and had the same common ancestor in the family Canidae. So you see down here now that these are in the same family. They have the same genus name. So they had a common ancestor here that also was a canis. Where up here now, this is not a, as common an ancestor to the American badger or the European otter. So again, this is probably different looking, but you need to be patient because we need to understand what this is. This shows up on an exam every year. Okay, now from that basic phylogenetic tree you just saw, scientists have devised something called a cladogram, which is probably a new idea for you. You see an example of the structure of a cladogram, cladogram right here in this slide. Let's go over some basic cladogram terminology and explanations and get them in your notes. Remember, this is something very new, so it may sound a bit complicated and foreign to you at first, so be patient. First, copy this diagram into your notes and leave room for explanations beneath. So go ahead and do that right now. Okay, let's go over timing first. First, look for the word root. Let me uh, open up the drawing tool. First, we're going to look for the word root right here. Okay, so check that out on your diagram in your notes and right here in the slide. Now, everything after the root, and what we mean by after the root is this way. Everything after the root 
is the most recent evolution that is, has occurred while everything before the root or this way everything before the root would be going back in the evolutionary process to a previous ancestor so there might be a big long row of things back here those would be ancestors that occurred previous to the ones ahead of the root here. Now make note of that on your diagram. All right, a taxon. You see the word taxon right here. The plural of taxon is taxa, T-A-X-A. -A. So if we're talking about more than one taxon, we're talking about a tax, we're talking about taxa. A taxon is a group of one or more populations of an organism or organisms seen by taxonomists to form a unit. Write that in your notes. For example, African elephants make up a taxon or gray wolves would make up a taxon as well. You also see the word node. A node corresponds to a hypothetical ancestor. Write that down. A node, you see an internal node here, and you see a terminal node right here. We'll explain those in a second. But the word node refers to a hypothetical ancestor. In other words, evidence points to this being an ancestor, making it an educated prediction, not a guess. All right, let's talk about terminal node now. A terminal node is the hypothetical last common ancestral interbreeding population of the taxon labeled, and it's at the tip of a cladogram. So this terminal node is the hypothetical last common ancestral interbreeding population. That's why it's located out here at the tip. These are terminal nodes right here. These three are terminal nodes. Now, an internal node that you see right here. An internal node is the hypothetical last common ancestral population that speciated or split to give rise to two or more daughter taxa. Write that down and we'll explain it. So an internal node is the hypothetical last common ancestral population that speciated or split to give rise to two or more daughter taxa. We would call these three daughter taxa right here. Now we also call them sister taxon. All right, so if this is the if they're daughters, then they're sisters as well. So they're daughters of the internal node ancestor, so these would be sister taxa. I know this is a lot coming at you. Be patient. Now, each internal node, that's right here, each of these internal nodes, which are the zeros, you see their symbol, whereas terminal nodes are the squares, the little squares here. Each internal node is also at the base of what's called a clade, C-L-A-D-E, a clade. A clade includes the common ancestral population, also called the node, plus all its descendants. Write that down. Now we'll talk about what we mean. So a clade includes the common ancestral population, the node, plus all its descendants. Let's give an example. For example, the clade that includes both taxon 2 and taxon 3. Here's taxon 2. And here's taxon 3. The clay that includes both taxon 2 and taxon 3 is hypothesized in this diagram to include their shared ancestor, which is technically an interbreeding population of organisms at internal node C, right here. So this ancestor gave rise to taxon 2 and taxon 3. So it's considered, this entire thing is considered a clade. 
So it, it, it's the sister taxa and their ancestor, ancestral node. This is a clade right here. Likewise, the clade that includes all four terminal nodes, one, two, three, four, and their most recently shared common ancestor originates at node A and includes all its descendants, meaning everything that comes after node A. So this entire thing would also be a clade. So because we're talking about this ancestor A, everything that comes after it, including this outgroup, would also be considered a clade. So make sure you understand that, and, and if you have to, get that in your notes. Okay, that's the end of part one of our podcast. So take a picture of your notes, submit them to Moodle, grab that part one study guide and answer the questions, and then we'll get to part two. Talk to you soon.